how to achieve mindfulness without actually having to meditate. Is this possible? This is a very, very interesting thing because a lot of people want a result without having to put in any effort. Well, it might be possible. Let's have a look because apparently there are seven proven methods for bringing a whole lot of calm into your day from inside hook. Well, won't that be special? Let's see here what Tanner Garrity has to say. Now, it's already starting off really well. In 1977, Roald Dahl published a lesser known collection of short stories called The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar and Six More. The titular tale is about a beleaguered British billionaire who finds peace and eventually fantastical powers by learning to calm his brain with a variety of techniques. And one such method involves focusing intensely on a single image in the brain for a long period of time. And that's quite interesting because there is some great research about focusing on iconography and, for example, deities and so forth, which I've talked about before in a video. And um, in the book, apparently, Sugar here manages to picture an orange for more than 10 minutes. And that's an extraordinary amount of time to focus on a single thing. And so Tanner Garrity here says, I can remember putting my dog-eared copy down and trying my best to do the same. When that failed, after eight or nine hopeless seconds, I thought of apples, blueberries, pears, no luck. Each time memories from earlier in the week or stresses about the upcoming one managed to invade my brain and tear me from the moment. Well, that's interesting. Hey, by the way, this is Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. Thanks for joining us here on this look into the science of memory and meditation. Absolutely love learning more about what you can do to use meditation to improve your memory and use memory to improve your meditation. And they sort of go together. So I love looking at articles like this. If you're new here, you know, make sure you're involved in this project because we are taking memory into the future with us, with each and everything that we do. So fast forward a couple of decades, Tanner Garrity says, and by the way, we can just go ahead and memorize that name, right? So one of the things that you'll find is there are these names where Tanner, oh, what kind of image am I going to come up with for that? Now, I happen to know a guy named Tan, and I happen to know a guy who's been on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast, podcast called Near Eyal. So we can put them together, Tan and Near Eyal, Tanner, but also can see him in a tanning booth, for example. So I'm thinking of a cafe where I used to hang out with Tan a couple of times, and now he's putting Near into the tanning booth. And then there's Garrity. Well, I knew a guy named Garrett. Actually, I met Garrett with Jonathan Levy of Superlearner fame in Berlin. And uh, so we can put those together. And, you know, Garrett can be pour pouring T on Jonathan. And now I've got two different memory palaces in two different cities. Tanner Garrity. See how that works when it's off the screen. <laughs> in any case, it's so much fun to just stop and think, how can we memorize these things? And you know, there's this opportunity here too, the wonderful story of Henry Sugar and six more. I actually don't know this book by Roald Dahl. 77 is also something you can pause upon. You can just encode it like that. So if you have a 00 to 99 PAO system, that you learn in the memory world, then, you know, Mr. Koch was my grade seven teacher and he's my figure for 77 because the major system that I use, seven is a K. So we have two K sounds here. So he was K-O-C-H, but Mr. Koch, and you know, it works. And, you know, uh, you, he could have a Coke bottle and so forth, pounding a, um, a bag of sugar. And maybe that sugar is with you know, what was that movie? Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, right? <laughs> so that just works real nice when you use these techniques. Um, but, you know, with the wonderful story, we got to get that in there. In any case, you know how memory techniques work. You can figure all this out. But you can encode in real time. And now it's off the screen. And I think Tanner Garrity, right? And then this book was in 1977. And... Um, now I'm just trying to think Henry Sugar, was it or something like this? But was it the wonderful what? And I didn't really encode the wonderful what. So it was the wonderful story of Henry Sugar and six more. So I might, you know, think of the wonderful Wizard of Oz and, and fix it and so forth. And then six more. Well, maybe there's a six shooting gun or something like that with um, Thomas More or something like this. Anyway, let's read some more. Fast forward a couple of decades and whenever I try to sit down to meditate, yoga, mat, dimly lit room, relaxing music, a scented candle or two, I still think of this failed fourth grade experiment. Formal attempts at proper popular meditation often end prematurely for me. With my mind whirring like the wheel of death on an old Dell desktop, 
I think about interviews I have to schedule, flights I have to book, contact lenses I have to order. Eventually I call it thinking, damn, it didn't work. After these failures, I'm less likely to attempt meditation again. Ironically, I now associate the practice with stress. Hmm. So, you know, I'm not reading this very well, but it's not really written to be read. Uh, so I'm not criticizing it, but man, semicolons, so Victorian. Let's not have them in the modern age, please. That, uh, this isn't uncommon, mind wandering. According to a 2016 study, only 12% of American adults practice meditation. Ooh, a number that nonetheless represents a 50% increase from earlier in the decade. That uptick has coincided with an ever-growing wellness industry that includes functional exercise, apps, and products that encourage embracing the present, from Matt Pilates to Calm to the Wave meditation system. Got to look into these things. I've never heard of them. Uh, Calm and the Wave meditation system. Let's remember that. But that number is still low, and the difficulty surrounding the practice is a prevailing reason why. In order to achieve mindfulness, the practice of paying attention to one's thoughts and sensations in a particular moment, people assume they need to first create a perfect environment. Not true. There is no perfect environment. If you've ever seen my video where I recite 32 verses of the Ribhu Gita, I purposely did it in a noisy environment because that's reality, right? Traffic, dishes, banging, etc. There is no perfect environment except for that this, <laughs> this right now, this moment is the perfect environment, is it not? What could you add to this moment right now to make it better? What could you take away to make it better? If you really switched on, this is it. This is the now, right? So noise at a minimum, pleasant sense and legs crossed with enlightenment, just a few deep breaths out of reach. This line of thinking, though, ascribes to too much importance to the activity. It's self-defeating, like punching a pillow in anger while trying to fall asleep. Traditional meditation may indeed work well for many, but it doesn't do it for you. There are other ways to achieve mindfulness. Think of activities in your life that erase hours from the clock. The ones you look forward to, or perhaps the ones you don't think much about at all. They come, they go. But by the end of it all, you feel measurably more relaxed. These activities can be considered backdoors to mindfulness. They're inherently meditative because you derive the same benefit from them that might come from a good 10 minutes spent picturing an orange. Below, we've assembled seven different activities that have been known to universally encourage elements of mindfulness. Importantly, we chose pursuits that an overwhelming majority of human beings can participate in at the drop of a hat. Surfing big waves, practicing magic tricks, or playing the French horn may help you achieve mindfulness, and walking a dog may get you there too, assuming you've got one. But these examples are inclusive and easily incorporated into the mornings, afternoons, and evenings of just about anyone. So that's interesting. You know, back to this thing about the orange, though. I mean, there's nothing wrong with focusing on oranges. And the question is, if your mind starts to skip, what strategy do you have to come to bring yourself back to the orange, right? Uh, this, this is something that, you know, you might want to consider. Anyway, I don't know that oranges are the absolute best thing to be focusing on, but you absolutely can think about holding on to it in a different way. You don't have to give up the focusing on a singular image like an orange. Could be something to really massage, to work. Maybe you have the orange moving around. Maybe you have the orange changing colors, etc. There's a lot of things to do. You could change its substances. So it could be an ice orange, a wood orange, a rock orange, etc. All right, so they're going to talk about cooking here. I don't think we have to absolutely go into the nitty gritties. But um, the point here is that he's saying it's a behavioral action that uh, necessitates presence of mind. That is true uh, to a certain extent. And you know, this makes me think of my wife who really is very patient and she will be there with the food and just stand there and watch it, which is something I could never do. I would always burn stuff because I would end up, you know, doing something else in some other part of the thing, which is a good thing why I don't, a uh, good thing that I don't cook. Water therapy, the restorative effects of cold water immersion are well documented. And um, yeah, absolutely. Being in the cold, they say it stimulates the vagus nerve. And they say also that hot showers <laughs> stimulate the vagus nerve too. So, you know, uh, you might want to think about that. But cold water encourages the release of neurotransmitters like dopamine, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Uh, one here in particular, nor norepinephrine, I've read, it does help with the production of um, uh, memory uh, like it's associated with stress but it also helps uh, and it, it will emerge apparently in the brain in greater doses when you're in situations of novelty and then you remember things better 
in any case, the author is telling us that he jumped into the North Sea and um, Tanner Garrity was his name. 1977 was the wonderful story of Henry Sugar and Six More. <laughs> I think that's what that was. <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted to look. Did I get it? 1977, wonderful story of Henry Sugar and Six More, Tanner Garrity. Woo, sweet chitlins. Yeah, it works. All right, so um, water therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Journaling. According to a team of researchers from Princeton University, Princeton University and UCLA, those who take notes on computers are less likely to summarize and retain information than those who take notes with their hands. Oh, they're, yeah, less likely. That makes sense. <laughs> For a minute there, I was like, what? No, it's not more likely, less likely. The studies and others like it has long been studied, or this study and others like it has long been cited as a reason to save handwriting, save a lost art while boosting our memory. But handwriting's effectiveness also extends into the realm of another mindful activity, journaling. So a nightly commitment to putting pen on paper will add special significance to your days. I've been talking about this for years, of course. I, I read about it in 59 Seconds by Richard Weissman, which I highly recommend. Adult Recess. I like that. That um, It's out of reach here, but that reminds me of Alex Pang's Rest, where we can get a great deal out of, of benefit from taking a bit of a rest, taking a bit of a break. Running. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, I like running. And I can't really run with my hip issues. I do do a little bit of treadmill sometimes at the gym. Uh, but what I talk about when I talk about running uh, by Meraki, uh, Murakami, sorry, it uh, <laughs> a little tired here. Haruki Murakami. Anyway, it's a very, very good book. And uh, one of the things that you might want to um, to do is read it because it equates performance like activities like writing with running and so forth and uh, absolutely something that you can mix and match I do walking and I mix and match it with aerobics so I don't think anybody notices me but uh, I sometimes just make these strange ambulations around various uh, you know concrete islands as I cross roads and so forth and the reason why I do that is because it's known in aerobics that that little bit of variety challenges your brain just a little bit. And uh, so I would highly recommend that. Live music. Interesting, interesting. I wonder what uh, study is uh, referring to this. There doesn't seem to be a scientific study represented there. But uh, <laughs> mini orgasms, which is nice, great. And then home and garden. So absolutely no doubt. I wouldn't think for a second that there's anything to uh, criticize there about gardening. But um, what is interesting, though, is that you know not all of these are substantiated with some kind of study. So it would be, it'd be interesting to see if there are gardening, memory, and mindfulness studies available. But yeah, is the promise that you will achieve mindfulness without actually having to meditate uh, true? I guess it, mean, I guess it all comes down to like, what do we mean by mindfulness? And I don't, I don't know that it's just task positive things. So what this article in Inside Hook here by Tanner Garrity is um, talking about really at the end of the day is task positive potential in these kinds of activities. So cooking, yes, you could be in the, in the zone. That's basically what we mean by task positive as opposed to default mode network in this far, part of the brain. Um, because that's where you're like I, 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 future or future, future I, present I, past I, etc. You're so focused on yourself. We, we, we find pain in that, right? And then when we're in the task positive network or the zone, or the flow, as Mihai Csikszentmihalyi put it in flow, then, you know, we're, we're free from suffering because we're there. But I'm not sure. I think that this article is ultimately stretching the idea of mindfulness, but, um, Thank you, Tanner Garrity, and thank you for reminding us of Roald Dahl, because that is something that I definitely want to look into further with an, an orange. Anyway, if you're interested in more exercises like these, I actually have exercises with apples and candles, no oranges yet, but I mean, you could use an orange at magneticmarymethod.com. So uh, please head on over and check up on that and register for the free course where we will uh, take you through a lot of wonderful, wonderful exercises that improve your memory and help you be more mindful by actually practicing mindfulness because being in the present moment right now is the most blissful thing in the world. And you are your memory at the end of the day and nothing more and nothing less. 
Megaston topos hapentagar kori, said Thales to us in the ancient Greek world, and he meant that space is ultimate because it contains all things, and space is appearing in us, and memory is really spatial in every possible way. When you think of something that you remember, where is it in space, right? I remember Tanner Garrity, and it feels like it's a little bit here, and it feels like a little bit there. And why? It's because, well, Tan in that cafe, right, with near, I guess I used, and Garrity, Garrett, I remember pouring tea on Jonathan Levy. Well, that's over here, my memory of Berlin for some reason. It's all spatial. And this is why memory training is a little bit more in the mindfulness sort of thing, because you're watching details go by and you just put it in space. You pull from the space of your memory and then you put it in space. In any case, it's a wonderful thing. I hope you'll join us and thank you for your kind attention. Until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.